All right, welcome back. Um, this morning, what I thought we would do is Chris has some uh, analysis that she'd like to go over that we can discuss, and then uh, I think the next step would be to, to finalize the list of phthalates, phthalate substitutes, and antiandrogens that are going to be the focus of our report. And then I'd like to start with a, a general outline in terms of uh, our report and begin to uh, make assignments in terms of who's going to write what. <clears throat> so, Chris, you want to start off? So, it, I don't know if these are really analyses or just plots, but just to give you a sense of some stuff that we did. Um, so I'm going to just show you, it's, it's interesting to me that <clears throat> how log normal um, the daily intakes are. <clears throat> I hadn't looked at these plots until this morning. Um, so what you're looking at, I'm going to go through the seven different um, phthalates that we're looking at, um, and or six, seven, whatever. Um, and what you'll see is on the, on the horizontal axis is log base 10, but you see, so you, just to remind you, if you exponentiate if you put the, the unit on the y ac on the x-axis, raise it 10 to that power, that'll be the value. Okay. So, um, uh, oh, these are uh, micrograms per kilogram per day. Sorry, I should have that on the plot. Sorry. Um, okay, so this is DBP. And I, I guess I'm just showing you this just to get a sense of the data. It's always good to plot. Um, DIBP. DEHP, DINP, DIDP. So, so that was, you know, I don't know if those are helpful, but just to give you a sense of it's, um, I think we were talking last night, I think there are places where we're overestimating and underestimating. We can talk more about that, but, um, so I, I think that's what the bell shapes are showing us on the log scale. Okay, so now talking about fasting, um, so this is a, uh, the total length of food fast. Um, it's a variable I found in Haines this morning. So I, I'm assuming this is the right variable. That, I think it's the same variable that Matt used yesterday. So I think it's the, the same thing. What you see here is that, so this is for only children less than 19 years old. Um, there were some that didn't have fasting values because we had 950 before we're down to 885. But you see two or three people have fasting levels up around 60 hours, which I don't think we need to, you know, from the rest of the plots I just said 24 hours or less, I, I, whether or not those are important. So what you're looking at here is the fasting hours on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is the same estimated daily intake for each of the chemicals, again, in micrograms per kilogram per day. The, the line there is not a, re, it's not a regression line I fit. It's just a smooth, a locally smooth line, okay? So it's going to curve with the data or not. Um, when we get into it more, if we're interested in what the slope estimates are and things, I can fit things with more piecewise models, but I haven't done that yet. Um, so DBP, I don't know if we consider, maybe we could flip through them and then come back and decide which ones we think may be food-based. Okay, so this is DBP, uh, DIBP, DIBP. Now we're starting to bend a little bit, DEHP, DINP, DIDP. But maybe these last three are the ones that are more food-based, where these are flatter. Can you help me understand the basis for the line? And since it isn't a straight line, there isn't a consideration of goodness of fit. Um, right. This is what I've done. It's a it's a smooth line, so it's it's like locally estimating what's going on, and then sort of averaging locally and changing. So goodness of fit. It's not a selected parametric model. Um, it. I guess if I change the degree of smoothing. It would be more wiggly, but I think it it fits as best you're going to. So, so I guess the thing that we could think about in terms of goodness of fit is um, how smooth do you want it? 
if you want it really wiggly, we could fit that, but that's, I don't think, I think this gives you an indication of how. There may be some data sets that are so scattered that they don't warrant the line. Um, how, how would you, where's the threshold for deciding that the data are smooth enough, or are collective enough that it warrants drawing a line through it, as opposed to scattered all over the place and you don't know what the line would look like? I, th I think I would consider something that looked pretty flat as being just scattered. But there's no indication up or down. I would say this, that it looks like there's more systematic effects. Now that's not, a, that's not with a p-value, but that's, but this was maybe a first indication. I can try to fit models that do this. Where is it flat? Where does it start to bend? And actually ask, is that slope significant? And what's the join point? I mean, so we can d drill in a little more. Um, it was 800 and what was 85. it? 85? 885. So this is only children less than 19 years old with fasting values less than 24 hours. Yeah. They're all. Uh, oh, so it'd be 883 or 882 or something. But the data points are clustered around 12 hours, give or take. So. There aren't that many data points at the low times. Right. Yeah. Right. Looks like the most of them are about I, don't, I can't tell about ten hours fasting. Is that what? Yeah. The mean, the mean and median was eleven hours. Okay. So if you if you took that group out and just looked at them, would that change things? Right. Which group out? The the uh, lower group, the biggest group. So go back to the the histogram. So the, the one that makes up about seventy percent of the sample. Just take those and do your plots. Take those values. Seventy percent on the lower side or in the upper side? I'm not sure where you're headed. Just that bin. Yeah, I'm saying just yeah. that bin. In the histogram, if you went back and you just took out, um, you know, the third. Yeah, take out the third bin no, there. you can't do that. Sorry, say again, Russ? Well, yeah. no, I think that's what that's Bill's asking. Well, yeah, so uh, that's right. These. You can't say, the, um, these. You can't do what I'm asking you to do. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not understanding the motivation of what you're asking. Yeah, the smooth, the smooth here. DEHP, there's a little curve there, I guess. I mean, we could we could have a criterion that we have to have some significance or not. I don't, I don't know how formal you want to be about this. We also don't know, even if these are uh, significantly influenced by diet, we still don't really know, is it, you know, 90% diet and so on. And, Or is it, you know, 50%? I mean, it may be, if it were diet, you might see, only diet, you might see a steeper slope. Is that steep? Well, what's steep? Yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, Matt, Matt mentioned it yesterday, but... Um, Pharmacokinetic models might be a, a, a way not to interpret the data, but just to, uh, to uh, think through the process of if it's all from food, 
get uh, something that looks like that. But, you know, is that enough to worry about in that? Now, this is on a log scale, yeah, but yeah. that's still relatively flat. Yeah. Is that worth worrying about? Lack of a linear relationship, or even a, lot, or even a, some kind of uh, r squared or, or, or r to the one half power relationship, tends to make me look at this as something that you know it's an interesting observation. But where does it take me? So, uh, right. So with some more time, I mean, I I could find some r squared values and things. Um, what does it do what's to help point? us? Yeah. What, what does it do to help us do what we have to do? And I really don't think it does much. Gets at the question, doesn't it, of whether or not you're going to correct for fasting? Right. Well, that yes. At this point in time, it's it tells me no. I don't think I can. Well, I don't. Would you would you draw that conclusion, Chris? That no, the would? expert yesterday have drawn a totally different conclusion. And I think we should stick to what the expert said. Where where's the data to prove it? In front of us. Explain it. Relationship. How would how would we analyze these data, Chris, to, to tell us whether or not we should I mean if you're gonna base if you want to base it on statistical significance, I could try to fit models that are like piecewise models where there's a left hand slope and a right hand slope. Mm -hmm. And I bet the left hand slope is gonna be a slope of zero. I, I won't force that, but I could let it estimate that. Then the question is: Is the right-hand slope is it significant? Significantly different, right? And if it's if it's do we want to be that formal? If it's significant, then we would adjust. If it's not significant, we'd leave it. Would you be comfortable? I, I think that would. How, how exactly would you do the adjustment? I mean. I, you know, I don't know. One suggestion might be to use the predicted line and based on the fasting hour, just increase by that increment. So people that fasted 18 hours would have a, on this case, would have a increase of you know, 0.1 bog. But at 12 hours, it'd be much smaller than that, say. Yeah. So you, you would pick a time. Uh, and normalize them or correct them all to a certain. Oh, if I, just an idea. Add back to make it. Yeah. Work. yeah. So these. Right, right. Um, yeah, or. You're looking at data at the far end. Minuscule compared to the amount of data that you have for the other part. I, you're, you're drawing conclusions based upon small amount of information. Well, I, I can't, I can't, I can't understand how you can do that. All the oh. data you have is dragged in the middle, and then you have a few points out here which are moving the slope down a little bit. As I said, without more data in the fasting hours farther out, I don't see how you can draw a conclusion. Well, and if it's not significant, we wouldn't do anything. I agree with that. That 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 I think is a reasonable plan, but I'm still a little bit leery because of the numbers. I think we should go with what Tom Burke said yesterday. We know that enhanced data is collected after fasting. We know that fasting will have an influence on metabolite levels in urine and therefore on the daily intake calculation. We know how hazy the data is in terms of how long is the fasting time and so on. It was Rick and also Matt who proposed to introduce some kind of factor to take account of this fasting issue. 
which in, I have the same opinion as you, it's not worth to get deeper into the problem because I don't know what we would distill out of it. Mm -hmm. So just as Tom Burke said, no matter if it's an adjustment factor or a factor of uncertainty, I would implement a factor because we have to take account of the fact that enhanced data is collected after fasting. I would set this factor to be two or three. We communicate this correctly. I think there's no problem. Oh, how long in, in your experiments with the, the fasting um, and then they had a meal or were dosed or yours or I'm not sure who else's, uh, from the time you ingest the, uh, the phthalates, how long, where's the peak urinary concentration? 95% of the dose would be out after 12 hours and the peak would be around 4 hours. So if you have a mean fasting time of 11 hours, we are in the area where most of the metabolites should have been excreted, mm -hmm. even more than a factor of two. And that's, that's fairly common with a lot of chemicals. I've done yeah. PAH experiments with yeah. fasting and dosing. I mean, what, what I'm asking is, it, maybe there is a peak there around where you, you would predict it to be at four hours. It looks a little bit later here. As, as, po uh, as you said, it's, it's so little data to the left. Yeah. I think there's nothing really to make out of it. No. I think this is a third proof that there's inf some kind of influence of fasting. There is some influence. We see some influence. But I, I, would, I would not try to calculate it to the last digit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I could totally agree with that point. There's a, there's a lot of um, additional variability that we don't know about here because in Holger's experiment you can assume that the, you know the intake. Here everybody has a different intake. So you take these 800 points and some people, you know, if you back extrapolated, you know, based on their fasting time, some people took in a high amount, medium, low, you know, very little, and then you're collapsing all that data together and trying to come up with a fasting line, but they're all starting at different points exactly. to begin with. Yeah. It's right. like a mis right. misclassification of exposure. Um, the other, I guess the other question I had, a lot of these are morning sessions. I think the data are dominated by morning sessions. And the speaker said yesterday, for a lot of us, the big meal comes at the end of the day, and that may be your biggest exposure. And that, I don't know, is uh, if that e might even be a bigger error. But um, worry about, but is you know, as long as is there's a if there's a reasonable way to do this. Well, it seems like a strength of the approach that we've been talking about yesterday and today is that we don't have to be, we don't have to speculate on the significance of this. You can run the models and look at the, at the impact that you get from one line, one curvature to the next. So it seems <clears throat> like doing a sophisticated statistical determination of is this significant or not is not very helpful because it, it isn't what we're really focusing on. You can run the models and we'll get the answer. But you're saying go ahead and, and run an, a statistical test to see if these are significant? Are you saying? No, no. Uh, use these lines to determine what the size of the adjustment is and then run the models based on that adjustment or no adjustment and see what impact that adjustment makes. And if it's trivial, then we've lost nothing. On the hazard index you're talking about? Yes, that. yes, uh, sorry. Yeah. But it might be at the end of the day if we say we looked into it, it made no difference. We're, so then do we just not continue with it? I think we discussed it yesterday that enhance is only one fragment of the puzzle. We'll have to get the data from the other studies. 
their fasting is no issue for us. I think the fasting is no issue with the pregnant women and the... Uh, well, the, the fasting time's unknown. Yeah, but they weren't asked to fast. They weren't asked to fast, but some of the samples may have been two may hours after the last meal. Yeah, but or, that's okay. That's yeah. a steady state exposure yeah. or snapshot of the population. Yeah. But they were not particularly asked to fast. Correct. So yeah. I think that will solve the problem anyway. So what uh, several of you have asked that we, we finalize is our list of phthalates, phthalate substitutes, and any antiandrogens that we feel ought to be plugged into your hazard index assessment. So uh, based on our teleconference, we all agreed that the Permanently banned one should be included, so that's DEHP, DNBP, and BPP. Um, and the interim ban, DINP, DIDP, and DNOP. <clears throat> and in terms of um, so other phthalates and substitutes, um, I think we need a little bit of discussion. So depending on exposure and toxicity profiles. So um, DIBP, DPHP, DEP, and maybe DMP were mentioned. So let's, let's make a decision on include any of those, and if so, why? <clears throat> the, the last four, mm -hmm. DID, DIBP. EPHP, DE, DEP, and DMP. I think, Holger, you made s several of these as, as we yeah. might want to look at, as I recall. You I think we have to include all of these in our considerations. And why? It, it won't be that difficult because they are major phthalates in use. And um, in children's material. Children's material or child care article or at least cosmetics or body care products that uh, might cause contact. As long as you feel strongly that they're going to cover the targets of opportunity, it's targets we have to deal with. I have no objections. Yeah. And include those four. Definitely. Well, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll them I'll, up there. I just want to make sure. Yeah, Are you going to type list? them yeah. in? Yeah. So. Okay. So starting from the band ones, DEHP. Band DIN or other phthalates DIBP. For the <clears throat> substitutes, are well, we all? Oh, excuse me. Could, the on the the second line, um, um, the DPHP, D, I guess DIBP is in the NHANES data. Is it? In the EIB, diisobutyl? Okay, but, but DPHP is not going to be in there. We can do it as a scenario. Yep, that's. Yeah. It, 
It is a C10 phthalate. Yeah. So it'll certainly be detected when analyzing DIDP exposure. Right. It, Holger, do you oh. mean it's included then in that measurement when it'll you say detected? It, it, it could overlap. Let's say. Okay. Just going to underline it because it's not specifically tabulated in the NHANES. Thank you for the information. I have different information in terms of biomonitoring. Okay, for the um, the substitutes, then we we had listed ATBC, MP. What um, am I going to be able to measure DMP? Well, it, it may it may not be that we're going to run these all through your hazard index. Okay. But there are things that we feel we have to address in the text. Because as far as I know, none of the substitutes are, are we're going to find in N. Haynes either, but those are on our list. So A, T, B, C, D, E, H, A, Dinch. Um, no. DEHA didn't show up in the articles that we tested, so there's no, we have no migration data. Okay, so I mean, let's put them up, okay. and then we'll, we'll talk about whether we want to keep them on the list. Okay. Uh, Dinch. Um, yeah. DHT slash DOTP. And TOTM. Then the other one that we did find was TXIB. Oh, yeah. right. okay. I think we Great. should include that. So let's talk about whether we want to keep all these on the list or uh, eliminate some. Well, we don't have to necessarily eliminate them, but we, DEHA and the totem weren't in the samples, the toy samples that we tested. So that makes it hard to do the scenario-based exposure assessment. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but, um, uh, and, uh, and they're also, they're not, I think they're not in NHANES data. I don't think DEHA is in there, so um, which eliminates that approach. So I think we could um, put them in parentheses. And the the thing about um, you know the scenarios is you can always, if you get data, you can always go back and put the data in. It add a, a chemical later. So we'll, we can. I think we have three different <coughs> reasons for having something on this list. One is that we're, we've got NHANES data and we're going to run it through the hazard index assessment. Uh, two, we, we don't have data, but um, there are other reasons why we should consider and say something about it in the text. In other words, if it's high volume production and it's it's in everything but we don't have any data then I think we can make recommendations that we need more information on that and what was the third <laughs> well, those are the two I think major reasons why we, wa we want to have things on the list not that we're going to 
deal with them each in analytically, but we're going to address them in the in the report somewhere somehow. Can I can I just say that the other limiting factor, uh, in addition to presence or otherwise in the NAINS database, the other limiting factor which will prevent inclusion in the hazard index approach is um, data, data about the profile. For example, DEP, uh, <clears throat> according to Paul Foster and Earl Gray, is not one of the <coughs> stalites um, with the right chemical structure to influence under an action in fetal life. Thought of the, the third reason for the substitutes at least. We, we want to be able to make the point, I think, that if these are going to be substituted, uh, we need to know more about them to see whether we're putting something in that's worse than what we're taking out. So, Yeah, and um, I mean, we, we can also treat DPHP as a potential substitute, even though it's not in the products. I think it, 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 it seems like a logical substitute because it's, I think the use of it would overlap DIDP and DINP. Concerning other antiandrogens, um, can we briefly reflect in terms of the wording of the charge to what degree we need to do this? Um, as you know, I'm not against it, but um, I think we need, or I need a bit more clarity in terms of um, what what really needs to be done and to what uh, well, level yeah, of detail. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's, they're beyond the scope of what we're doing. Um, I'm not opposed to uh, having some discussion of that, um, especially if there may be a significant um, public health uh, concern or if they contr significantly contribute to the effects of the phthalates, um, but they're not the, our reason for being here. And I guess my main concern would be is first we should do what we're, what we need to do. And I, one thing I would not want to do is say, no, don't include something that the chap thinks is important. But, okay, but doesn't, oh, sorry. Sorry. Say, doesn't it um, add to the background effect so that if we're, you know, if we, if we know we have exposures to these other anti-androgens, that gets to the point that Tom was making about just because we don't measure yeah. it, it's not zero. So at least if we had a, a, a subset that we could of evaluate as being yeah, and, sort of and that's why I wouldn't say yeah. don't do it. And I think that's a good reason to, to do it in your model. But do the... I, I, I also agree it's, uh, it will influence, I mean, the Silver Book has uh, outlined various, um, in the framework of a, of a unified approach to dose response analysis, they've uh, outlined various uh, possibilities depending on background, exposure to other chemicals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I think to the degree that matters, we would have to consider exposure to other antiandrogens. But I would also think, like Mike, uh, that it is probably not required to push the analysis to a level um, which we have to do with uh, phthalates. Yeah, and I think if you uh, think of it as a, a, a core project, um, and then you can always say, and then if you add these other compounds, it increases the risk this much. And I think, I think Chris even showed that in some, in some of your slides. So. Uh, yeah, definitely. It doesn't have to be comprehensive, but it could be enough to say, uh, by the way, uh, more work on these other compounds needs to be done, um, and partly because they're a lot, uh, as far as I can tell, they're, they may not be in our jurisdiction. They may be in someone else's. But in that regard, Andres, you may be able to help with this. 
it, so I've, I've been maybe limiting myself in the thinking about this approach and that we needed the data in in Haines. But if we actually had um, external data for uh, other anti-androgens that are in, you know, high levels that with high hazard values or low ha whatever, you know, where they would be concerned, we could actually add a hazard quotient to our calculation just as a constant, perhaps, right? So, I mean, it, it might be that we could think about the anti-androgens based on not just what's in NHANES, but based on what are, are there other anti-androgens that we would be worried about if they were if they were considered in addition to the phthalates. Yes, I agree. Uh, I think, I, in my opinion, we, we, we would have to consider in which direction our analysis is influenced by consideration of other antiandrogens. But that's not to say we can uh, conduct an analysis to the level of detail that is possible and required for phthalates. I know already, I mean, it's simply not possible, looking at the enhanced database, there, there's simply large chunks of chemicals missing, which would be relevant, or, uh, and often our information about the profile of uh, in-use pesticides is so fragmentary, the data are just not there, not even in vitro data. So there are serious data gaps. But it, is that a sort of livable compromise for you? Hmm? So a, a sort of a discussion of what other anti-androgens are out there that we would be concerned about? No, in, yeah, if possible, yes, but uh, rather in what direction our analysis will be moving if we were able to consider anti-androgens to the full detail. Yeah? Will the risk estimates go up, down, stay the same, that sort of qualitative estimation, but without, <coughs> already we can acknowledge that the data will not be there to, to uh, extensively quantify the contribution of other antiandrogens. I think I was looking at this a little bit <clears throat> differently and not a question of what other antiandrogens are out there that we would be worried about. I look at it as a theoretical question <clears throat> that if you had other products or other chemicals out there that work by the same mechanism of action and were anti-androgens, is there any po possible enhancement of the effects of the phthalates? As opposed to trying to make a case that vinclozolin is in trouble because it's an anti-androgen. I don't think that's our intent. It's more of a theoretical question that any chemical, we just happen to know a couple of them because of their biological activity. But it doesn't mean that they represent a real hazard or that they <clears throat> represent a serious concern that CPSC would be weighing in on. See, I, I actually have a slightly different approach or thinking, and that is that the way you describe that, it makes me think that you're asking the question of interaction. Is there a synergistic effect from these other chemicals with the phthalates? And I'm actually more, more concerned about the additive effect. I mean, you know, the fact that there's so many chemicals um, the background is, yeah. Uh, yeah, a little bit of each one. Um, that, that's why I use the word enhanced. Which makes because that, sense. Because that allows right? for a small additive increment or it could be potentiation. Any, any form of synergy that would be greater than no effect of one on the other. So I think if it allows us to answer a question, is it possible to enhance the effect of phthalates by other materials to which people or infants might be exposed, I think that's a good question. And the thinking, it seems to me, is similar to what we're going to be talking about in terms of food-based um, phthalates as well. I mean, we're saying we can't just look at the, the products in these toys in isolation because the phthalates are coming from a lot of different sources. So we're not going to isolate them and just look at the toys. We're going to look at it based on the universe of, of phthalates, but then there's a broader universe of anti-androgens, which is also a background sort of... Right. So that's why I would <clears throat> put this as a theoretical question, because it doesn't matter if the other anti-androgen comes from dust or comes from some other route. We're simply asking, regardless of the source of exposure, regardless of which anti-androgen it is, <clears throat> is there, should there be concern about potential enhancement of the effects of the phthalates? Yeah, we, I would agree with that. That, that was, would force us into 
considering scientific evidence in the literature, experimental studies. If they are there, we note them, um, but not necessarily then um, quantifying quantifying the additional contribution of anti androgens, other anti androgens to suspected effects of phthalate mixtures. Do that, we would need a really good data set. So, so we would end up with statements like, this is our best estimate for phthalate combinations. However, we note that this estimate will move in this or that direction if we consider exposure to other anti -androgens. Do we know which direction? But if I look back at a paper Subjected, by... Right. Subject, I could... If I look back at a paper by Camp and Faust... Um, there is some nice table five and table six that actually shows the added hazard quotients based on each chemical. And there are a lot of, you know, a half do or dozen or so here that are other than phthalates. I mean, it would be relatively simple to add that kind of a additional quotient to... Now, I'm not saying only do that, but in the discussion of here we go, you know, with a... now. And assuming that they're all affecting the same endpoint, which is testosterone production or which is what his activity, yeah. then it's going to enhance. It's going to shift that curve to the right on your log 10 plots. Well, that's true. It's got it's also possible that <clears throat> chemicals in combination would have more than one effect. Mm -hmm. So there could be an effect on testosterone, but there could, see it be, there could be some other effect of the interaction between the two chemicals that might neutralize that. So th there are a lot of ways chemicals can interact, not just based on hormonal activity. Yeah, but do, do we have examples that Oh, we... no, no, this is a theoretical thing. Yeah. Also, the theoretical, you're saying, the theoretical point is that you're assuming that these other anti-angiogens are going to be combined with more than one or two of the above to cause a shift in background. When you're <coughs> doing pesticides, you're dealing with a specific segment of the population. Whereas if you're dealing with bisphenol A, you're dealing more generally like you're dealing with, with phthalate. So one has to be careful in terms of deciding how to frame the question, I think, about these other anti-androgens and whether or not they are a significant burden beyond the burden of phthalates under the conditions that you would be ascribing for the population that's part of the enhanes or some of the other groups that we're going to be looking at. I think from what you've said and what Andreas has said, I think all we can do is to say that it, it has the potential to enhance <coughs> And, and we have to leave it at that. I mean, you could make statements uh, like Byrne would like to say that it, it could also uh, mitigate bonds. And I, I wouldn't suggest we'd get into that. But, for example, <clears throat> if some substitute came into play for one of the phthalates, but there were other phthalates remaining in these products that had anti-androgenic activity, mm -hmm. now you're going to add one that structurally you don't think is going to be the same as a phthalate, mm -hmm. but it has anti-androgenic activity. I think manufacturers should consider that in the future <clears throat> when they select substitutes or additional chemicals in products so that they, they can look back and see, aha, they, they kind of answered this question <clears throat> when they did their modeling, and we need to be careful here. Mm -hmm. So I, I see a value to the future, not just about what's out there today. So then we are in agreement that we're not going to list a specific or specific anti-androgens, correct? We're going to address it in, in a theoretical sense, that we know they're, they're out there, 
they're potentially. If we could use those, the court and camp oh. and Faust. And I don't know, um, Andres, how you chose those um, particular chemicals. Um, was it based on any exposure issues or was it based on anti-androgen knowledge or what were the criteria? Two, two criteria. Do we, we, um, we had to have information about exposures, which proves to be a bottleneck for a large number of chemicals. And secondly, we had to have information about in vivo antiandrogenic effects, which is another big bottleneck. Mm -hmm. And that limited severely the um, number of chemicals we could look at. Okay. Yeah. With to differing degrees of detail. All right. So are we proposing then to include those on our list of anti-androgens? I believe it theoretical like we were discussing before. Do you want to put the list in? When we put the list in, do we do we sort of buy it? Well, I think I Chris, think you were saying that you could use that information to modify your equations to take into account those. I, I was think, I misunderstanding uh, the, you? Yeah, no. The, I, the way I'm suggesting is that we would have the approach that I that we described so far that has the distribution mm -hmm. of everybody's different. However, to say. There is an effect. There could be this background thing that kids are exposed to. I mean, we don't know the exposure. It's, it's a hypothetical situation, but we have these hazard quotients from this paper that says these are anti-androgen, anti-androgen chemicals with potential exposure. Um, so we could just add those quotients. So it's just going to be like adding a sum. We think it's a hazard index for this child of, you know, 0. 0.6, but instead, with this background, it's an additional 0. 0.3, and it moves it to the right. Yeah, and add, add the same thing to everybody. Everybody. So it's, yeah. it's, it's just a... And I think it's just to, to make the point that there are background things that we probably should think but about. To me, it's, it's murky because, again, you don't know that you'll have a combination of all these ma other materials in with the phthalates. I mean that that's that's the murkiness. It's it's not the fact that you cannot develop scenarios that are hypothetical cases saying this is an increase of the background, but do you have some scientific basis from which to derive that development of that case, or are or are you doing what we used to do in <sighs> Superfund risk assessments? You know, putting yourself out on a limb because these summations don't really exist under normal circumstances. Can I clarify? Uh, the the criterion has to be twofold. Number one, evidence of of co-exposure to these chemicals. So okay. that that is that we know, although we can't quantify it in all situations. And the second criterion is sort of a biological, a degree of biological plausibility backed up by experimental evidence that these compounds can indeed act together, and that is the case as well. So, uh, but at this stage, really, um, I think, I think we are, we're in agreement. We can, uh, we note, we should note the presence of these chemicals, um, but at this stage, uh, I would be reluctant to agree on a list because mainly, well, for two reasons. Uh, number one, I don't really think that's required in terms of the charge. And number two, uh, because the um, situation in terms of our knowledge base is a little fluent and we're likely to see improvements of this in the future. So uh, in order to allow flexibility, I would leave it as, uh, at that without agreeing on a list at this stage. Go forward. Could I use the Court and Camp Faust list um, with the with the idea that it is murky? It is adding something that may not be. We don't. It's not as clean as the other approach where we know these are children with these levels. But it, it, to me, it, it's back to the the traditional hazard index approach where we we know nobody's at at a point you know at a median level of all chemicals or a 95th percentile of all chemicals. It's just a it's a it's a point to make that there is additional hazards to things that aren't accounted for there, um, and the list is not complete. The list is thoughtfully chosen, but yeah. it makes the point, and then that's it. I mean, yeah. okay. 
are in agreement on that sense. Thank you. Just two questions I have. What is the reason for the brackets? Yeah. Uh, it's because right now we don't have, we did, haven't seen products with DEHA, so we don't have data. Actually, we might have some older data. Okay. But uh, totem, I don't think we, we've seen, so. Because product wise, it's not yeah, an issue. Yeah, I mean, pro okay. we don't have migration data from the okay. products. Just for matter of completeness, I would include as a must all of the lates of endocrine activity. And uh, one of them would be DPP. So that's the phthalate squeezing in between dibutyl phthalate and DHP, which is of known to be stronger endocrine activity yeah, than and, and dipental phthalate. And anything else that's active in that? As antiandrogenic activity? Any further comments on our list? We're all happy with that. Just to put something out there, not that we'll, would do anything with it, but apart from the biological activity of these chemicals at receptors, et cetera, there's, just like with medications, there's medications that alter the metabolism of other medications and there can lead, therefore lead to toxicity. So it, it's not something we know a lot about. But it may be something we may want to just mention that there could potentially be other chemicals that may decrease or increase the metabolism of phthalates, for instance, glucuronidation, and may therefore modify their response. Um, you know, not something we would do anything with in a, a risk assessment, but I think just to be aware that uh, a chem another chemical, it may not be an antiandrogen, or won't be an antiandrogen, but it could lead to decreased metabolism of phthalates by, for instance, inhibiting glucuronidation or, or one of the oxidative steps. Is there an example that? Well, I don't know of um, real specific examples. We had published a paper telling Andreas about it um, about five years ago where we looked at PCBs and phthalates and we looked at additive interactions and our hypothesis were, were that the phthalate or that the PCBs were um, affecting the glucuronidation of phthalates and therefore potentiating their half-life, for instance. That was an environmental health perspective. We didn't look at mechanism, you know, it was a human epi study, but we did see um, basically greater than additive if uh, semen quality. So we use something called the relative excess risk index, which is basically uh, looking at additive interaction rather than multiplicative. And it, I can send that, but. I mean, th that's just why I, I think about it because, you know, even the chemical, another chemical may not 
be an antiandrogen. It may not have really endocrine activity, but if it blocks or, or slows down the metabolism of another chemical, in the end, what the cell, what the biological system sees is a potentially increased response. will inhibit the metabolism of this other medication you're on and you'll become toxic. And you know, and I think this is a very, very important point to make because, you know, it would be nice to just package this up in a really nice little box and say, here's the phthalates and let's just do that. But in reality, there's so much uncertainty and so much concern about all of the chemicals that are out there. Um, I think to leave the, the sense that, you know, here's what we can do in the workable thing that we're working on. However, um, more to worry about. I think that's something that we can raise in the section on uncertainty and variability, mm -hmm. because clearly that accounts for some of that. I guess I have a fundamental question. When's toxicology going to take the turn? to look at these things in mixtures and do the type, right kind of experiments to understand these problems. Because toxicology is a very difficult time dealing with multi-chemical interactions, even with the same biological endpoint, in the same rat study or mouse study. So are we just preaching God, motherhood, and apple pie, or are we doing something that's going to be meaningful that somebody's going to pick up on? I mean, clearly, I understand totally that there are chemicals out there that exist in combination in various environments. The fact of the matter is, is that for me to try to ascribe a risk always reverts back to the single chemical risk assessment with that additivity when we know there could be synergism, there can be antagonism, there can be additivity, there can be all kinds of other stuff. So are we really going down a path where we feel that there's going to be a realistic approach, a realistic conclusion that people can take away and work with beyond what we're going to do? I mean, is it, or is this a theoretical exercise? <clears throat> Paul, one way to, to get some pressure is through the National Toxicology Program. Because we did studies on individual phthalates, but there haven't, I don't think there have been any new NTP studies on phthalates for some time. CPSC could recommend through the NTP channels, that there would be some mixture studies done, and I, I think that would be legitimate. As long as we don't leave it as a theoretical argument, I'll be fine, but knowing full well that there's an extremely, there's an extremely difficult hill to climb to achieve these kinds of ends, especially with chemicals that are not from the same type of source, like pesticides and anthalites. <clears throat> but, Paul, there's already experimental evidence about mixtures of such chemicals in the peer-reviewed literature. That's number one. And number two, uh, as far as I know, NTP are anyway actively considering uh, to conduct various mixture experiments with precisely the chemicals we are we're interested in, but it would help a lot if they got a little additional nudge. Well, either either that or if, if there were, you know, something concrete. One thing NTP is interested in is not just straight tox tests, but anything like mechanistic type of experiment. So, um, yeah, we can certainly do that. Well, Andreas, I mean, you've done a great mouse study, right? Rat, Rat I'm sorry. Um, so you could conceivably redo that study with another exposure to something that you knew affected metabolism of phthalates, let's say, and then look at the results. Could you not? Well, that's not so easy, but uh, I mean, it could be done, it's feasible, but uh, funds would need to be provided. I mean, we have ongoing experiments, but... Um, it, it's... Uh, there are concepts available to to address this, so it's a little more than pie in the sky, really. Well, your point is my point. 
that if we're going to do this, it's got to be more than pie in the sky or a theoretical construct. It has to be defined reason why. And the issue, and, and the issue has to be built upon the fact that these anti antigens build upon each other, and you have a weight of material in your body that is from multiple sources with multiple chemicals but have similar endpoints. And that clearly in the future, we're, if we're going to attack this in a holistic way, we have to reconsider how we do these experiments. And because um, I've, I've, you know, I've heard this, people have written about this for years. I mean, there have been major environmental health perspectives reviews on the need to look at mixtures. But in the end, falling far short of where but we want to go. Paul, can I take pleasure in sending you a couple of key papers then just you see for yourself? Key papers are wonderful, and I'm very happy for them. But the point is that the overall approach does not necessarily blend into that concept. You have to see a change in philosophy to make that work. It's not theoretical. It's realism. We've got Andreas's paper. We've got uh, Earl Gray's paper on, on mixtures. So, I mean, I think there has been a change that's been reflected in, in research and publications. So, I mean, not everybody's jumping in and doing mixture studies, but at least that's now out there. And I think people are saying that that's uh, what we need more of. So I don't understand where you're coming from in terms of that there isn't this shift in, in toxicology thinking. I think there already has been a shift. Okay, um, so I think we've we've ended this with uncertainty. That's probably appropriate. Uh, <laughs> so what I'd like to do now is, um, as you all know, we have to um, prepare a report, and so I think it's it's time now that we start in in a broad outline of who is going to uh, do what. And so if you would permit me, and, and Mike's going to put it on the screen, to uh, provide a, a very broad outline, which we can then discuss um, in terms of how we're going to do this. So um, in terms of um, an introduction, uh, I think that would be uh, Byrne and, and my responsibility to, to put that together. And that would include... Uh, such things as, as the, the charge, um, the, the history of, of phthalate um, discussions in terms of the other uh, chap, and et cetera. In addition, I think that um, Bern and I ought, ought to summarize, and, and, and perhaps Andreas can help us with this, uh, the, the animal studies. Um, and why we're focusing on the uh, reproductive toxicity as, as the endpoint. So that, um, again, if you put names, so. Okay, so. Let's and, and Mercus. I are. And the same for animal toxicity. And I think that would then, I mean, not necessarily in the way we would, would put this together, but in terms of um, information that we need would lead into um, a discussion of the um, human phthalate syndrome. And I, I would think that that would be... I, I was distracting him, so... Make sure you say that again. Yeah. So the, the next, not next section, but the next piece of information that we need would be um, the human phthalate syndrome. But, you know, all the background that's available on that uh, because that's how we're going to relate this to, to humans. And I think, Russ, you would be... Yeah. I mean, as we've... Um, 
put more details on this related to the primary animal endpoints or all of the human? Well, I think you, would, I think you would start broad, but come down to. And then to more details on what's relevant to the endpoints in the report. And, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yep. Sounds good. How much can we actually use what's in the NRC report? Can we, can we hold off on that until we go through this? So that would be Hauser. Um, another big component uh, is going to be what I've listed here is, is biomonitoring and phthalates. Uh, and, and clearly, um, I think this is a section that, that Holger can do in his sleep. Um, and it, it sort of leads up to another section that we're going to have, which is the hazard index uh, assessment approach. But so Holger would do that. Um, another section that we have to address um, is exposure scenarios and phthalates. Even though we're not going to do that in detail in terms of our hazard index assessment, we need to um, discuss that. So exposure scenarios and phthalates, and I think, Paul, that's clearly the section that, that you can write. Well, but I, I'd like to have it done independently and then submitted to the group we'll put it together and then we'll look at it and then we can I mean it's not that that's going to be the final document then we'll decide how we're going to actually put this all together and that I'm thinking I'm hoping that that can be the uh, part of the main discussion in in March so then the next uh, uh, I have down here as um, risk assessment related to individual phthalates and then the cumulative risk assessment. Um, and that would be, again, using your, your approach, the hazard index approach. And so this, I would, I would uh, think, perhaps has to be a collaborative uh, writing, Chris, Holger, and, and Andreas. And Bern and I were talking that there are a couple other things that we came up with, and I, uh, I'm not sure exactly who will, will write it, and I don't think that probably needs to be done before we meet in March, but we'll need to have a section where we relate your data analysis to our charge. And I think that may, may be done by committee. Relating data to the charge. And then we'll need to have a, a one or two sections on, on variability and uncertainty. And I think <coughs> rather than assign someone to do that now, I think that will, I think, fall out of the, the sections one through through six. And then we'll, we'll, we'll come up with another list of what those are and, and we'll decide who, who's best to deal with those. Maybe we add to point eight also the point adjustment? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Adjustment. whatever we come up with. <laughs> Excuse me. 
So how does that look for a first approach? Number six. Following. The hazard assessment is a tool. Yes. To the risk assessment. Right. Just so like that would the be a method section. Just like the biomonitoring is a tool to the risk assessment mm -hmm. and scenarios. I look at the risk assessment as the culmination of all those different tools, including. So I think there should be a separate section for the hazard index. That's one of the crucial uh, components of the risk assessment. Rather than introducing it within the risk assessment, you need to fundamentally lay it out, show what the results are, show the conclusions you gain from results just from that analysis. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't want to dictate the individuals how, how to do this. I, I would think they have to come up with how they're going to do this. Uh, in other words, uh, some kind of uh, introduction to risk assessment in general and then focusing down to their hazard index approach and what that tells us, how they that, did it. But that's not all risk assessment. I, well, I, I take your Maybe point. Maybe I have the wrong words. I take your point, Paul, but I, in my mind, it would sit very well under number six. So number six could be further fine structured. Into, you know, there we have to take up what the preceding chapters have said about exposures. Uh, we also have to take up what the preceding chapters uh, have in mind, number two and three, say about uh, effects, uh, the right. spectrum of toxicological effects. So, therefore, I agree with you, Paul, uh, hazard index should be explained, but really essentially is part of risk assessment, where you aggregate information about exposures and, and hazards. As long as there's a separate section somewhere where it explains yeah. what its role is, I'm not going to argue about it, but I, and I think for each section, individuals category. that are responsible have to develop an outline and and you know but, what what it is they're going to but do. This is a crucial point that we made yesterday. is a crucial point in our analysis, yeah. and it has and it's not just a section. It's really a defining Clearly. bit of information. And and the final document's got to reflect that, and that's mm -hmm. going to be, you know. Burn in my charge to, to put that together okay. in a way that, that highlights that. Just another question for clarification. Uh, under number two, summary of animal toxicity, would that include a summary of experimental evidence for mixture effects? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Then uh, put my name down as well okay. under number two. Okay. Great. That's good. And overlying all of this, is that this relates to phthalates and phthalate substitutes with some search for impact of other antiandrogens. That's the other part of the focus. I mean, that's, that's what's behind this whole outline. They're appropriate. Every section should deal with those three categories. What do you, what do you mean by the individual? So, chemicals, but, and their um, mixture. Number six. So are, are we going to address each chemical by itself, or do we focus? Um, Didn't you do that in your analysis first? Or was it? I'm trying to remember. Now. Not sure really what you're looking for there, for individual I'm not chemicals. Either. I mean, we can certainly show... <laughs> I mean, this morning I showed distributions demonstrating exposure, effect, biomonitoring data demonstrating exposure. Um, do, do we need to link each individual also to some hazard by itself, even though we know that it's always a mixture? You one, don't have one, them one of the eight factors says, you know, uh, the phthalates and so on individually and uh, uh, in combination with the others. And I think for the individual ones, uh, one interpretation is that it's the, the interim band ones is where you, we might want to do individually as well as. 
um, call them out individually. I mean, that's one way to interpret the language. Something, something we discussed about, uh, discussed at the last meeting, probably both meetings. Um, but if you were going to do an individual risk assessment, I mean, it would be there on the interim band ones and maybe on the substitutes. Is that largely what you guys gave us yesterday? Can we take things like, what, I, mean, I don't really know what to do. You guys well, I, I, I don't think they mean, yeah, individually all 29. No, no, just our list. Yeah. But even then, um, as the far as down. individually, um, you know, going back to the, the eight points of the charge, um, you know, uh, does that mean um, the, the just the three interim banned ones? Because the, the permanently banned ones are gone. There's not really any need to do that. But the interim band ones are the ones at issue. And the substitutes. I would look at this that, that we have to include enough information on the interim band and the substitutes to justify why we're including them in this analysis in the report. And then we simply make a statement that we recognize there are dozens of other phthalates that for one reason or another didn't reach the threshold of needing to be included in this report. That doesn't Either, get you, back to the form of the analysis that Chris is worried about. Do we do this, a list, do we do the hazard index for each chemical or do we do it in, enlist them individually or do we do them as, as a mixture? Well, you know, um, uh, that it's, depending upon what their products they're But it, it's also, it's a matter of partly interpretation of the charge and I yeah. think that for, uh, let's see, for certain ones like, if, if you do call out individual ones, it would, I would only do the three um, interim band ones. Right. I agree with that. Um, I wouldn't do try attempt to, to do it for all of them, and uh, pro probably also the the substitutes uh, to the extent that they they aren't known to have this anti-androgenic activity. So you wouldn't do the cumulative risk assessment for them. Well, with the substitutes, wouldn't it matter? Wouldn't it turn? Wouldn't it be also the point of determining what products they're going to be in? Right, right. If the right. products are not going to provide exposure scenarios that lead to children's yeah. contact? Right. Would, would, would that? Well, yeah, yes. But I mean, go, actually, going back to, I'm getting off track. Uh, Chris's question is about for numbers, applies to number six. And say individual and cumulative. Well, mm -hmm. we definitely want to do cumulative. Individually, you might do DINP, DNOP, and DIDP. Uh, maybe. Specify what you mean by do. Well, <laughs> calculate the hazard indices, the distribution of hazard indices. In, you know, the chemical by itself? In a, uh, maybe. But maybe it should be. Can I intervene? I think it's very clear from the charge that we have to do both. We have to yeah. do uh, individual chemical risk assessment, traditional approach, you know, considering exposure, considering um, reference doses, then deciding. Uh, what what is the ratio if we take that approach there are other approaches you know there's a there's a variety of approaches possible we need to consult the silver book and the unread book maybe whatever and on the basis of and i would also agree uh, 
with Mike that this should be done definitely for for the intermediate band phthalates and if we can for for substitutes. Yeah, and of course as far as we can for yeah. substitutes. But and I foresee great, great, great big data gaps there. Well, and then yeah. on the basis of this, uh, also then bringing in the band, uh, we can then do a cumulative risk assessment along the lines of what you've uh, and Holger have presented yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Is that actually better broken into two parts? Here's the individual parts and here's the combined parts? Or, or we're just saying we're going to start writing logically and then we'll organize it when we see it all written down? Right. The, the, uh, hmm. Just it requires, I did an analysis of the charge yesterday. We did this together yeah. and the, from what I can see, this charge definitely requires us to do hazard assessments for all these phthalates. That's very clear. Whether we yeah. have to do risk assessments for each of the individuals is not so clear to me, but we can do it. In, in what we do, uh, for all these chemicals on our list, um, we won't be able to do all of those steps for all of these chemicals. Either be, if they're not in the NHANES data, we can't do uh, modeling from the NHANES data. But for the ones that aren't covered by NHANES, we can probably do some sort of scenarios. And so I'm assuming in this package we have uh, the issues discussed about anti-androgenicity for each of the chemicals? Either there's evidence or there's not evidence, if, or is it just not? And, and I suspect that in most cases there's no evidence one way or the other for those chemicals. Just get back to the whole point then. I mean, we're focusing on anti-androgenicity for our overall approach. If we don't have evidence of that from some of the chemicals, are there other things that we need to think about in terms of the hazard of those chemicals? I, I would say in that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We, have, we can go back to what the NRC have done. Um, yeah. Where it was considered that these anti-androgenic effects are the critical ones and not other endpoints, and and then yeah, work from there. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. I don't think so. Yeah. I think in our section on the animal studies, we can make it clear that these chemicals are known for their carcinogenicity in animals, and hepatotoxicity, and other endpoints. But as we reviewed the data that would allow us to make the judgment that we needed to in the charge from CPSC, we focused on the anti-androgenic effect. It goes across species and there is a part of the syndrome is recognized in humans. And as a result, the whole report is going to focus on that one endpoint of toxicity. And, and I don't think we need to get into the carcinogenicity and all the other concerns about phthalates. My point is that I agree with you completely in terms of the phthalates. I'm thinking about the substitutes. Is it the right endpoint for the sub? Do we need to address? I think for the substitutes, that's a good point. And, and I think for the substitutes, it's generally going to be other endpoints. Um, and I think it's going to be a case-by-case -case thing where each chemical is going to have a you can calculate a, a, a reference dose, but it, it's probably beyond different endpoints, and it, it most likely th there won't be a need to do a cumulative risk assessment on the substitutes. Have has your staff put together um, a document like this? Reference to the, the substitutes? Yeah, well, what, there's a document um, going back to the first meeting um, that Versar did on five of the substitutes. We're working on TXIB. That'll be done soon. Um, and then we also have the six uh, ph uh, phthalates covered by the CPSIA. 
So those are, are well covered. Um, some of the ones, diisobutyl, DPHP, are, are coming, and dipental are coming. They're not covered in this report here. Um, but they are on their way as well. Well, then in terms of this getting started, we will do what we can with what we have. And then yeah. as we get more information, we'll plug that in. Yeah, but I think you're right. I think the, the substitutes are going to be uh, um, handled more individually and in, in more of a, a, a separate compartment of the whole. In fact, I'm wondering if we should even have a a separate section on the substitutes. We would certainly include that in, in the animal studies that yeah. we, whatever we could find what's there. Um, in terms of biomonitoring would include that so I I think that would be included in the different sections it could be uh, as, a yeah. subsection. as a subsection but the other sections are going to focus on anti androgenicity and they won't in the They'll stand out from that number six is gonna be by definition gonna be different for the substitutes than it is for the phthalates um, and, and we, we may just, yeah. we may find when when we put these different sections together uh, that it makes sense to break the th substitutes out and treat them separately, and, and then we can do that. But we'll have the information from the individual sections that we can put together. Mike, where in this report do we acknowledge that we <clears throat> listened? to a number of invited outside experts and what they, not what they told us, but what, why we invited them. What did we expect to hear from them? I, I think the good place to do that is the, in the introduction mainly, but then throughout all the sections um, and, and up to and including the discussion and conclusions, we can certainly refer to what we learned from those speakers. For example, in your uh, case two situation where you got the um, points of departure from Earl Gray, that would be a, a place where you would insert that. Okay, so any um, additions to this outline we missed? So if we get um, data from somebody else, from pregnant women and children, infants, right? Um, would that actually be discussed in section three and in section six? I, I would think so. Section four. Okay. Four. Yeah. Yeah. Four, I, I can four help with six. If, yeah. Four may also be in three. It would probably be discussed in three as part of the health effects in, in those studies. I assume that the um, problem formulation step will be part of the introduction. I guess we need a pro problem formulation section somewhere. A subsection. In that context, would it be <clears throat> appropriate and maybe helpful to recognize <clears throat> that we're following the gray book? 
silver book I, and I, including yeah. that problem that problem formulation aspect but we're preserving the red book approach as was recommended in the so I think we can acknowledge that it's probably yeah. it makes our report timely I would envision the history piece of the introduction being a history of the regulatory handling, not a history of phthalates. I mean, that, there are books written on that. Uh, I mean, that's cer certainly something I would help with. How's that spilled in my arm? <laughs> Mike, I think we're we're getting down to the et cetera's now. And yeah. Th this is, I would raise one that is in that category, but most reports now make some kind of a statement about conflicts of interest of the authors. Well, there, well, there well, you know, well, I think we could include something about the CHAP selection process, yes. which would cover that. Any other comments? Not hearing any, I would like to propose that we individuals have a draft document prepared that we could begin to look at at the March meeting. Is that reasonable? And that we would uh, cancel the January meeting unless there's some reason that we need to meet I think it's unlikely that we're gonna have enough time to to write anything substantial between now and January 18th given the holidays um, so then then the next meeting would would be primarily focused on two things hopefully by that time you will have been able to do some more scenarios with the data that you provided with and we will talk about what we've written and March 30th and 31st yes, yes. so is there any time I know you guys haven't spoken to whoever you're going to speak to about additional data but is it reasonable to expect that could be more timely than not um, well, we, we we can we can ask them, and it's it, uh, prob I guess up to them um, if they have a lot of questions or if they just say, "Oh, sure, I'll email it." <laughs> um, and I think uh, Ru Russ is going to give me an, a name, a list of names to contact, and I'll also, um, if you happen to know the key studies. Um, because, I mean, I have them, but if you have them at the tip of your yeah, tongue, I can I can mention a, f a few now. Um, I was actually thinking probably the the one you could get the quickest um, would be from Shauna Swan's mm -hmm. study. Um, you know, Rick, who was here yesterday, is part of that, and Shauna was here and is yeah. um, very involved. I think she probably has data maybe on I'm guessing three or four hundred pregnant women, um, and I would. Think given the criteria that we need, she could probably share that relatively quickly. And the other would be the group at Columbia University, yeah. Robin Wyatt, who I I know, W H Y A T T. Yeah. But I think Ricky Pereira is probably the 
PI on that. And then at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, Mary Wolf, W-O-L-F-F. -O -O -F. In terms of children, though, or, or infants, well, the zero to three-year age group, I'm not as familiar with data sets. Well, do all the, of any of those studies women. include the infants, the small they're, children? They're all taken during um, pregnancy, maternal, and okay. um, I don't think any have really collected urines, at least within that three to three, zero to three year age window. They may have when the child was six or eight, but that yeah. wouldn't be as helpful. I'll, I'll look through the literature and see what there is other than Blunt or since if there's anything since Blunt. Brock or Brock, Brock John yeah. Brock that was an old paper like the bulletin of yeah I don't remember the journal well it was um, I mean they only <clears throat> measured the mono esters yeah but wasn't there Holger a paper of kindergartners from Germany or daycare centers only 35. 35. But, but wasn't it's the one with the long name beginning with S? The oh, Sheila? Oh, Setianorama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I think, yeah. was she with Shana Shana's. Swan? So yeah. 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 We'll do a thorough scan. Yeah. yeah. I'll do that right away. I think Shauna Swan's group is yeah. is where you could get some of this data relatively quickly. I'd be happy to, you know, Mike, if when you email her, you want to CC me or bring me in. Um, uh, yeah, whatever uh, you prefer. I'll, I'll probably. Well, the other thing is to, you know, exactly what parameters we need. So I'll run it by you and Holger at least, uh, in Chris before Chris, yeah. I. Send something off. The only thing when I mean I agree that the January meeting should should be canceled. I'm just wondering if if needed, we should reserve a, an hour block for a phone call during that time. If we need it, if we don't need it, just yeah, it, just it's it's not it. a bad idea. Just if to there's do a status. questions that arise as people start getting into this, the status of. The data would, of where we are, that. well, all of these things. Yeah. The writing. Byrne brought up the point that uh, on March 30th and 31st, we're meeting on a Wednesday and a Thursday. Um, and, and we typically you know, stop at noon or, or two on the second day uh, so people can make their flights. Is that going to provide us enough time since hopefully we will have a lot of documents to go through, uh, plus any data analysis that Chris has done. Um, do we want to think about the idea of expanding the meeting on either side? Starting on a Tuesday rather than a Wednesday or going to Friday? And Well, when we chose the date, I think there was at least one person who couldn't make the day before or the day after, so. We won't have any outside presentations either. I mean, we'll, well it's have probably eight, not eight to five or, or whatever time day. If we're going to keep it on the thirtieth and the thirty-first, is there a way that we could start at eight o'clock on the morning of the thirty-first of the thirtieth? So we get a full day in on yeah. Wednesday and at least a half day on on Thursday. Because if we start 10, 11 o'clock on Monday or on the first day and we quit by 1 o'clock on the second day, we're really only talking one day. I, I have no problem um, extending either way. Let me check the calendars. Let me find them.
might force me into having to travel back on April Fool's Day. Okay, for whose column C is Russ he said he couldn't make it on Oh, couldn't make it on the 29th. And Byrne said he he could if he had to. Okay. Yeah, and I'd getting Yeah, and I'd come in I could come in the, the night of the twenty ninth too so that I'm here at eight and not at you know, nine or whatever. Yeah. Okay. It is, but we're gonna start at eight o'clock. Is that correct? Yes. For me, that's the only way to get back to the West Coast without spending another night. Is there anything else we need to talk about before? Um, would would we plan to share this with each other, like two weeks before, or three weeks, or a week, or yeah? Is there Ides of March, we'll share. We'll be done by April Fool's Day. Yeah. <laughs> well, our last, our first meeting was on tax day. Yes. Back taxes from the national. I, I think that was a sticking point. Um, in, in the paperwork somehow. <laughs> but I, I think to get re, to, uh, something to do with reimbursing them, you need a social security number. I'll, I'll send her an email. Uh, um, let's see. Um, in, in the meantime, one, one question before we move on is that is there a member of your staff that I can talk to about the products that we have to consider for the kids, for the substitutes and the partially manned? Well, we can, you and I can I, talk. I, I need to have, talk to somebody on staff to, yeah, or, or and, your, then, and then get the they get the information so that I can use that as the basis for these scenarios. Yeah, I mean. That's all I'll really need. Yeah, and if, if I can't answer all your questions, I'll get to the people who did the, the actual studies, the lab people or the, the statisticians. Any, any kind of reports that you have that I can yeah, look well, at. Yeah, well, I'll start by sending all of, sending all of that. That's fine. Okay. And then Sounds if you good. have any more questions, we can follow up. The sooner you get it to me, the better. Yeah. You've got, should, uh, if you <laughs> have the CDs from the first meeting, but I'll send it. Send it. It's so much easier yeah. for me trying to find CDs. Yeah. Okay. That'll work. Any other items for discussion? Mike, are you? Um, I think you're good. I, I think I'm good. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, very good. 
we're, we're earlier than we uh, we thought. So we're adjourned. We're adjourned.